Hello everyone, welcome back again in this channel with me Jennifer and this is the second episode of the sociolinguistic series. Our topic today will be about multilingual community and in this episode I'm going to be talking about domain, vernacular and standard languages, lingua franca, the difference between pidgin and creole and then we're going to touch a little bit about multilingualism and we will end this section by discussing about diglossia. Okay, let's start with domain. Uh, domain is a term that is used in sociolinguistic to refer to a typical interaction between typical participants in a typical setting. So yeah, the most important factors in domains are participants, topic, and setting. Why is it very important for a sociolinguist to analyze domain? Because by analyzing domains, we can um, know the norms of language use in a community. Like, for example, usually um, a sociolinguist will try to find as many data as possible about the interaction between certain people, let's say in this example, parents and children, when they are talking about uh, certain topics like their daily life, what's for dinner, and where to go on a holiday. Um, in the settings that they are talking, at home perhaps. So a domain will involve the same people, will involve the same topics, daily life perhaps, and will involve the same settings. A domain is repetitive. It's kind of like genre, if you still remember that word. Yeah, it's kind of like genre. You know that something is a narrative or something is a descriptive because there are certain things that are repeated. So domain in, a so, in sociolinguistics is, well, I can, I, I think I can compare it with genre because it means it has something repeated, the people, the topic, and the setting. So yeah, that is a uh, domain. Now for our discussion later, of course, and you can also always leave a comment. What do you think is your typical interaction with your friends when talking about schoolwork at the campus or now by using Zoom or WhatsApp? Yeah, leave a comment below. Now let's move on to the next topic, which is the vernacular and standard languages. Vernacular language and standard language, they have different level of formality in, in sociolinguistics. When we talk about vernacular language, vernacular language are language that is not standardized. It means that you don't have a formal rules to guide it. It means that as long as people you talk to understand what you mean, just go on and speak. Nobody will mark you for that. Nobody will say that you're wrong. A vernacular language also means that you are uh, you you first learn this language as you learn to speak. So this is your mother tongue. This is your first language, the language that you first learn as a baby. We call this vernacular, why? Because I don't think that you will be, um, you will be forcing a baby to speak in a very standard and formal language, would you? I mean, you won't expect a baby to say, saya mau makan, tolong beri saya makan in Bahasa Indonesia. You, you will just be happy if the baby say makan, makan, right? So yeah, vernacular language are not standard. You cannot force people to, to use standard language or you cannot force people to use certain rules when they speak in their vernaculars. And yeah, because this is very, very informal, it means that you can only use it in informal functions like in your daily interaction with people you know, with your family, with your um, significant others, with your friends. 
So yeah, vernacular language, they are very simple and the vocabulary are very informal and you don't really have to think about the rules when, when speaking vernacular language. But of course, when we talk about vernacular language, sometimes it also means that it is only a local dialect of a standard language. Like, for example, Sundanese is a standard language, but every, but every area in West Java will have a different version of their Sundanese, which probably are not listed in the Sundanese dictionary or in Sundanese grammar books. They are only used in certain area of West Java. But again, when we talk about local languages like Sudanese, Japanese, Bataknese, Madaris, and other local languages in Indonesia, we can also call them vernaculars. Because when it is compared with Bahasa Indonesia, which we use officially, um, vernacular language or local languages like Sudanese, they are not recognized legally in, in the government. I mean, you cannot write your birth uh, certificate in Hana Charaka, right? You will have to use a formal Bahasa Indonesia. You cannot even use Gua Lu in, in your uh, birth certificate or academic paper. Because if you do that, it will be informal and the government will not um, recognize it. Okay, so yeah, vernacular language is basically something that is quite informal and it has no certain standards, which is different, of course, from the standard language. Standard language are codified. It is standardized. There is a certain prescription, there are certain rules that you need to follow to be called a good language speakers of that language. So, for example, if you use English language Formally, if you follow every single structure, like in your verb patterns or noun patterns or connecting ideas, if you're there already. So yeah, you know which one is wrong. You know which one is right. You know that I am happy is a correct standard grammatical sentence in English. But I happy, even though you understand what it means, it is not standard. Right? So that is the difference between standard language and vernacular. And usually, standard language are used in more formal settings. Now, I'm not going to talk about Bahasa Indonesia. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to talk about English. I'm just going to talk about Bahasa Indonesia in this case. So, standard Bahasa Indonesia, I think, nowadays, only exist in government um, documents and education. I mean, in textbooks. I don't think you will you will talk to your friends using a very formal grammatical structure like hari ini sudah akan hujan. Even that is not formal. Karena sudah akan is not a formal grammatical structure in Bahasa Indonesia, right? So yeah, I am not sure that when you talk about standard language, I'm not sure that this kind of language exists outside of a legal se uh, setting. Now, standard language is made uh, out of vernacular language, of course. Now, here we will see what we call as the standardization process. So, language, all languages, comes from the vernacular language. So, this is the first step of the process. When there are vernacular language, like I'm going to take, again, the example of Sundanese. So vernacular language, Sundanese, usually they are different in every area, like I used to live in Tasikmalaya, and the the Sundanese, they, the dialect in, in Tasikmalaya, they're somewhat different from the ones um, that is used in Bandung. And I also have a friend in Cirebon, and they use different version of Sundanese. So yeah, that is vernacular language. But then some people will try to make a standard dialect. So it means that Sundanese as a standard dialect. 
when a vernacular language goes to a standard dialect, they will try to make it more formal and they will try to make a rule about, okay, this one is considered polite, this one is considered um, Sunda alus, this one is considered Sunda kasar. And when we have those prescriptions, when we have the rules, when we have the books um, that says this is wrong, this is right, we have a standard language. Okay, so standard language is the one that has rules. And sometimes in a country, the standard language is the one that is, that is considered more prestigious. It is considered more, um, it is considered higher to understand standard language. And sometimes standard language will be used officially as the language of the country, which is called the official language. Okay, so standard language are not always the official language. Official language of a country is usually standard, but not all standard languages, like our local languages, are the official language of a country. Okay, so yeah, that is when we talk about one speech community. Now, we're going to move on to the multilingual speech community. Now, of course, nowadays, when we talk about um, talking with people from different countries, which you, you don't know the language, of course, you will say that I'm just going to use Google Translate. It's fine. It's easy. It's accurate nowadays. But... Yeah, sometimes it is easier to use the same or a common language that both of you, you from your own native language and the other person from another native language, to, to use a certain language that you both will understand. Now, this kind of language is called the lingua franca. So yeah, let's see what lingua franca really is. So a lingua franca is a language serving as a means of communication between different linguistic groups in a multilingual speech community. I think the easy one is to say that um, in Indonesia, when you go to another area in which you don't understand the local dialect, you will immediately refer to use Bahasa Indonesia, right? Because you get the idea that everyone in Indonesia will understand Bahasa Indonesia, okay? Now, yeah, again, if you have, if my first language is Sundanese and your first language is Japanese, we don't communicate using Sundanese and Japanese. That will be a disaster, right? We're going to use a lingua franca, a language that we both understand. Or, for example, uh, if yeah, some of our students are from Korea, and of course, if I speak Sundanese, it will be, yeah, they will not understand me. And if they reply in Korean, probably I will only understand 10% um, of it. So yeah, we are going to use a language that we both would, uh, will understand, which is, yeah, it happens to be English or perhaps Bahasa Indonesia in some cases. So that is uh, how we use lingua franca. Yeah, usually, a lingua franca developed as a trade language. So yeah, really economic factors, it plays a significant role in language change. Linguas franca are very useful and yeah, sometimes it replaces um, the vernaculars. Mm, I think I can give you an example in which a lingua franca can replace vernacular. So, as you probably know, a lot of Jakartans, a lot of Jakarta children, they tend to speak in English more than using Indonesian slang, right? So, because they know that, okay, English are widely, sorry, English is widely under, 
understandable. A lot of people understand English and it is considered more prestigious to, to speak English. So they stop talking in they they stop talking in slang, Bahasa Indonesia slang or informal language, they start speaking in English. So this is the case where lingua francas replace vernaculars because it means that if they speak in English, they don't only um, they're not only able to speak with people in their um, group, but they will be able to speak also with people in outside their, uh, their group and it is very useful. So yeah, that is lingua franca, a language you use, a common language you use with people from the different speaking uh, language communities. But what if, what if nobody knows a lingua franca? Nobody has a common language. Now in this kind of case, a new language is created. Pidgin and Creole language. Let's first talk about the Pidgin language. A Pidgin language has no net, uh, native speakers. So, yeah, if you go to a new place and you only know Bahasa Indonesia and those people in that place only know their own language, so you don't have a common language, um, you cannot use a lingua franca, but you will need to communicate with them right? So you will have to develop a new language. Pidgin is that new language. Um, Pidgin don't usually have large range of vocabulary because it is used only for a certain purpose. So for example, if you go to a, a new country to sell, um, to sell cloth or to sell jewelry, you will only develop words that are designed to be able to communicate about what you want. So if what you want is selling and buying, you will have vocabulary about selling and buying, not outside of those. So you're, if, you, if you want to sell jewelry, you won't have words for food, you won't have uh, words for leisure you won't have words to express other feelings that are not related to buying and selling jewelry uh, pigeon language are usually short-lived and yeah people usually look down on pigeon language because it means that uh, they think that people who who speak in pigeon language are not educated but well yeah what do you think yeah, leave a comment below or yeah, just share it with me later in the discussion forum. Now back again, yeah, pidgin language is short-lived, which means that it dies if the needs for communication is gone. If you no longer want to communicate with them, you don't need the language anymore and it will die down very easily. But if... In some cases, pidgin language, instead of dying, it develops into a larger set of language, a larger set of structure, and it becomes a whole new language which covers all possible domains. When this, when this happens, the pidgin language is no longer called pidgin. It will switch into creole. So yeah, Creole are pigeons with native speaker, which means that um, the pigeon will be learned as a first language by children. And of course, when children learn a new language, they will need a wide range of vocabulary to be able to fully develop as children. So they learn it as first language and then it covers all communication domains. You can find it now on uh, 
a talk for the weather. You can talk about farming. You can talk about your hobbies using this language. When it happens, it is no longer called a pigeon. It is now called a creole. Now, sometimes when the speech community of creole is big enough, they will try to make the creole into a standard language. And sometimes when the speech community is actually a country, they will try to make this creole a standard language and then turn it into their official language, the official language of the country. Interesting, isn't it? So sometimes in this modern world, some of the languages that we know are probably started as a pidgin, which is developed as a creole, and it is now a national language of some country, and we don't even know that they are a creole. So, yeah, those are the differences between creoles and pigeons. Yeah, the creation of a new language and, of course, adaptation from lingua francas, like what happened in um, that Jakarta thing that I talked about, um, makes a speech community to become bilinguals or multilinguals. So before we go on further, of course, let's talk a little bit about the definition. So in social linguistics, we recognize these three types of linguistics ability. The first one is, of course, monolingualism, which means uh, the ability of a person to use one code or language for communication. And then bilingualism, from the word bi, of course, you understand that it means two. The ability to use two codes or languages for communication. And multilingualism. Multilingualism means uh, the ability to use more than two languages. Although nowadays people just say bilingual to refer to both bilingualism and multilingualism. Multilingualism or bilingualism uh, is divided into two types. Individual bilingualism and societal bilingualism. Of course, by saying individual, it means that the person speaks two languages and it is quite fluently. And it doesn't matter whether the group of people he lives with are able to use those languages or not. Okay? Um, and then, that is individual bilingualism. So, if you can speak Sundanese, Bahasa Indonesia, and then perhaps English, Korean, and Russian, and no other people in that, in your community are able to use those language, it means that you are an individual bilingual. You, your bilingualism is individual because nobody else speaks those language. When it is a societal bilingualism, what happens uh, is that the, there are two languages or more that are spoken by most members of a speech community. Like in West Java, Sundanese is used uh, together with Bahasa Indonesia by most of the people in West Java. Of course, the degree of ability to, uh, of a person speaking in those two languages will differ from one another. I mean, one person can be very fluent in Sundanese but not really good at Bahasa Indonesia. One person are equally good at both languages or one person is, equal, is good at Bahasa Indonesia but only understand Sundanese uh, passively as a listener. But at least those languages, those two languages, Sundanese and Bahasa Indonesia, are, are very common in that society, in that speech community. So that is social, uh, societal bilingualism. Whether or not you understand, but most people in that area speak the same languages. So yeah, when we talk about 
different languages, we call it bilingualism. But does it mean that when you don't speak two languages, it only has one variation? Well, not really. So we have a term in sociolinguistics called diglossia. Diglossia is a term that means that there is two speech varieties that are used in a speech community. And each variety is only used in certain domains. Now, this is what happens when you live in a somewhat monolingual society, like in English. So, we have formal English, we have non-formal English. The formal English and the non-formal English are two different speech varieties, right? They are the same language, but they are two codes. They are different codes. And that is what we call uh, as diglossia. So, yeah. Diglossia is divided into two, the high variety and the low variety. Now let's see what it means. A high variety or the H variety are the ones that are used in more formal domains like the government, education, news, um, formal religion speeches, public speeches, so people usually use the high variety. The structure are more rigid, thus um, the vocabulary are more complex and difficult. So yeah, that is the high variety. So you don't uh, commonly use the high variety when you talk with your friends. When you talk with your friends, you will talk with uh, a more informal variety, which is called the low variety. Yeah, low variety used in informal domains, like when you talk with your family, with, with your friends, or when you pray on your own. I'm not sure that you will pray in formal Bahasa Indonesia. You will use whatever language is or whatever code that is more appropriate for your means, right? So yeah, entertainment usually use the low variety. I'm not sure that if you watch um, gossip channels or if you watch influencers on YouTube, they will they will not use high variety, I think, unless they are trying to tell you something, right? Okay, so that is basically what diglossia is. Diglossia, however, is divided into three types. This type where it is divided from formal and informal is called the classical diglossia. So classical diglossia means that, yeah, the one that I explained earlier, in one society, yes, some form of the language is used only on a certain domains and a modern version is used for informal communication. That is classical diglossia. The second type of diglossia is called the creole diglossia. Now, of course, you still remember the word creole, right? Now, creole is created from another language. This is what happens in creole diglossia. The H variety is from a different language. And the L variety is created as a creole from the H. An example that we can use is in Nigeria. Nigeria uses the H variety, um, English language as the H variety. So their formal language, their national language is English. But nobody in the street or whatever they are speak English. I mean, not formally. They usually use um, a mixture of English and their own uh, native di uh, dialect and it creates another language. Of course, another language is Creole because children are speaking it as well. So yeah, that is uh, the second type of diglossia. Now, the last type of diglossia is called the border diglossia. The border diglossia means that the H variety originates or it comes from a neighboring community or a country next to your country. 
and the L is a local variety. Well, perhaps we can, uh, if you want to make it local, again, I'm going to use Sundanese. So the, the high variety is the one that we are taught in schools, Sundanese. Uh, Sundanese high variety are the ones that we use in formal school uh, paper for Sundanese language. But then the L is a local variety, which means that you in Bandung will speak a different kind of Sundanese from those in Bogor or those in Tasikmalaya or those in Cianjur. So yeah, that is border diglossia. And with that, it closes my episode today. So yeah, thank you for watching. I will be seeing you soon in the next episode and of course in class later. Meanwhile, I hope you all stay healthy and stay safe. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.